parliamentarians have bottled it. She needs to make it crystal clear. Unless we get some progress in the next couple of weeks, we're off. What's your exit deal with the EU? I wouldn't pay the EU anything. Right. So if the House of Lords, of which you are a noble member, admitted in its own report that actually we have no legal obligation to pay a single penny. We came up with the expression, no deal is better than a bad deal. The reality is, WTO is a different type of deal. It's not no deal at all, it's how most other nations around the world operate. There's a huge opportunity if we leave without the terrible deal. We can take back control faster, sooner, and we can give much more certainty to business. Please welcome to the stage, Richard Tice. Hello, Brexiteers! Can you hear me at the back? Welcome to Birmingham. Welcome to this, the first, the launch rally of the new Brexit party. Now, if any of you, if any of you think you've come here to sit and not participate, you're wrong. We need to hear from you, we need to see you, we need to know that you're with us. So ladies and gentlemen, do we believe in Britain? Yes! Do we believe in democracy? Yes! Does Theresa May no. believe in democracy? We're on track, you're in tune, that's fantastic. That's a good start, keep it that way. Now, um, before I carry on, as you know, we've just launched so I thought we'd show you the first video, our launch video, for this, the new Brexit party. Hopefully technology will work. <laughs> Maybe they're not quite with us. We Yet. Have been no, they're not. Betrayed. That is why I set up the Brexit party. It's why we're going to fight the European elections on May the 23rd. And that is just the beginning of what is needed in this country. Democracy is under threat. And when politicians fail to deliver, there must be consequences. I was too young to vote in 2016, but now I support the Brexit party because I believe in delivering on democracy. It's time to recognise that actually we are an incredible nation. This isn't about left or right. It's about standing up for our right to be heard. Successful, hardworking, so much to be confident, enthusiastic and optimistic about. That's why I'm supporting the Brexit party. We are a single nation. We wish to remain a nation. They must adhere to the promises made to the people. Let's be optimistic. And for the benefit of our children and grandchildren, if you want a home and you're a Brexiteer, you join the Brexit party now. Some of you may know me, but some of you may not. I've been involved in the world of business, in construction and property for over 30 years. I've started and run businesses small, medium and large. I've been involved in building thousands of homes, creating tens of thousands of construction jobs in the property industry. I've attracted hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds of investment into the UK economy. And I've had an interest, a small interest, in politics. <laughs> it's fair to say it might have grown a little. Um, and rightly or wrongly, I've been only ever previously a member of the Conservative Party. Well, I had to resign yesterday morning. Um, because... Because, like many people, from whatever party, you think about it and you say, eventually, enough is enough. Can we tolerate? Can we tolerate this feeble, weak leadership? So that's why I agreed. That's why I agreed to be chairman of the Brexit party. And yesterday... And yesterday, it was fantastic to have our formal 
launch in front of the press. And we didn't do it in some sterile, boring room in Westminster. No, we did it here, the heart of the country, in the Midlands, Coventry, in a factory. Anyone from Coventry? What's happening to the football team? A bit worried about that. Um, but we did it in a family-run business, 50 years. Because, of course, we all know that actually small businesses are the bedrock of the British economy. They were so welcoming, so accommodating, you know, 20 staff, and they were carrying out a specialist, specialist process, powder coating, spraying manufactured products. And amazingly, half of their business is for machines and products that go all over the world. And yet, they're not afraid to go to a WTO Brexit. They believe in their product, in their skills, and having the right pricing. They're a fantastic example. It was wonderful to be with them. And we'll just show you a quick video of uh, yesterday and some of the candidates that we announced uh, at our press launch. I think we have a parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. Our task and our mission is to change politics for good. I joined the Conservative Party in 1984. This is not a decision I have made lightly to leave a party for which I have fought at every election since 1987, from Maggie Thatcher through to Theresa May. I know which one I'd rather have representing us now. I do deals for a living. That's precisely what I do do. And the last thing I will ever do is take no deal off the table. It's absolutely bonkers. I have been fighting continuously for the past two and a half years to secure a brighter future for our coastal communities post-Brexit. Our political class, that's from all parties, have spent their time and efforts, along with their friends in Europe, to create an institutional structure of political regulation that has depoliticised the economy and de-democratised politics. Never again, never again, ladies and gentlemen, should we ever, ever allow ourselves to be humiliated in this way. But if we carry on under this current leadership, we know what will happen. We'll be here on the 31st of October, Halloween night, and we'll be writing another begging letter. It must stop. This is a, a battle that we shouldn't be having to fight, but we are having to fight it, and we are going to win it. The thing is, it's easy to forget, amongst all of the noise and the doom and the gloom of the Westminster bubble, it's easy to forget we've got so much to celebrate this wonderful, proud, strong, fantastic nation of ours. We know we're one of the top five economies in the world. We're a member of the G7, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, part of the Five Eyes Security Network. We're the head of the fantastic Commonwealth of Countries. We've got... We've got the best trained armed forces in the world. Three of the top ten universities. London, the greatest capital city possibly, with its leading financial centre. We've got the greatest football league. And of course, Liverpool, the greatest football team. Probably a bit controversial. We've got so much going for us. And despite all the noise and the gloom that you read about, let's remember we're still outperforming as an economy, Germany, France, and Italy. We're still employing, in fact, we're now employing record numbers of people in this country. That's amazing. Unemployment is at record low levels. We should be poised, ladies and gentlemen, to go from strength to strength. But of course, that requires confident, bold, 
motivated leadership. And sadly, currently, that is lacking. Instead, <laughs> instead of having so much to celebrate and shout about, instead, we've been humiliated utterly and totally on the international stage. Our Prime Minister, writing not once, but twice in the space of a fortnight, a begging letter to ask overseas leaders as to what we should do, where we can go, how we can survive. I mean, honestly, you couldn't make it up. So not only have we got incompetent leadership, we've got an incapable negotiating team who've been trying to sort out Brexit. We've also got untrustworthy politicians. <laughs> they, they say and write things in manifestos to get elected. And then, actually, we find they never meant it. Instead, they're doing dodgy, dirty deals with each other behind closed doors. We've got, we've got a civil service. We've got a civil service, ladies and gentlemen, that supposedly was the envy of the world. And actually, we found out. We found out that they're simply not up to the job. This has got to stop. It has got to change. We cannot suffer this humiliation any longer. I want to tell you a story about communities and the difference with politicians. A florist one day went to have his hair cut at the local barber. And after his hair cut, he looked all right, he came to pay the barber. And the barber said, no, I can't take any money. This is my week of community service. It's on me. The following morning, when the barber came to open his shop, there was a thank you card on the ground outside with a bunch of flowers from the florist. The barber thought, that's very nice. That afternoon, the local policeman came for a haircut, came to pay, and the barber said, I'm sorry, I can't take any of your money. I'm on community service this week. And the policeman said, fantastic, thank you very much. The following morning, Outside the store, the barber came to work, and there was a thank you card and a dozen delicious donuts. <laughs> a particular favourite of mine. That afternoon, the local member of parliament. <laughs> you know where this is going, don't you? The local member of parliament came for a haircut. Should have shaved his head properly, but anyway. Um, <laughs> after the haircut... He came to pay, and the barber said, no, I can't take your money, sir. This is my week of community service. Well, the following morning, the barber comes to the store. Good Lord, there's a, there's a queue. There's a dozen members of parliament lined up for a free haircut. Well... That, ladies and gentlemen, is the difference between decent, ordinary citizens who make this great country an incredible nation and politicians. And as, as, the, late, and as the late and much missed Margaret Thatcher said, politicians are like nappies. You know where this is going, too. They need to be changed often for the same reason. <laughs> Trust. Trust is an important word, ladies and gentlemen. It's vital to everything we do. But trust in democracy in this great nation is being destroyed. To hear people say... I'm never going to vote again, it's not worth it, is utterly 
devastating, and we have to stop that. So we have to say that enough is enough. We're not going to stand for it. It's time to fight back. We have to say we're going to take on the establishment. We're going to take on the vested interests. We're going to take on the civil service because we need to change the way this country is governed and run so that it's run properly for the people. <laughs> and that is why, in launching the Brexit party, we stand for something a bit different. We stand for competent, capable, common sense politics that works for the people. And that's why, when we launched yesterday with our first candidates, you could immediately see that our candidates are going to stand, the 70 that we're going to put forward for the European elections, they will all be, in their own right, successful, experienced, with a track record of getting things done and making things happen. We saw yesterday entrepreneurs, um, educational specialists, a specialist in fishing, the wonderful June Mummery. You know, these are people who've got a track record of achieving things, and that's what we need in order to change the way that politics is delivered in this country. Not only have we got, we've had over a thousand candidates apply, so it's fantastic to be able to choose such a great uh, group of candidates, but we've also got thousands and thousands and thousands of people generously, kindly donating online to help grow this party. Because as you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, politics doesn't come for free. You know, we have to invest in order to create change and to make this happen. So we've got thousands of people donating online, but of course, I'm going to say this, we always need more to make it better. We've also got, excitingly, we've got activists, volunteers, whole local branches of other political parties saying, what do we do? How can we get involved? How can we help? We want to change. We're excited by what you stand for. Former MPs, former MEPs. You know, this, this gives us great hope. This shows that actually there is real appetite for change. More and more people recognise that Westminster has failed. The two-party system has failed the British people. The appetite and the enthusiasm for change is tangible. And it's got to start here and now. We need people to vote in these European parliamentary elections. It's absolutely vital because we need to use it as a springboard to transform politics in this country. Who here wants to help transform politics in this country? Yeah. Never, never, ladies and gentlemen, given how much we have been let down, never has the opportunity been greater. And never has the appetite been stronger. This is our moment. Politics is poised for change. But we need everybody's help. All of you here, you need to spread the word. All the people listening on live stream. This is the moment when we can start the fight back because we know enough is enough. Firstly, we've got to restore that trust in democracy. We've got to send a very, very clear message to Westminster in these European elections. Listen to us. We meant it the first time and we mean it this time. Leave means leave. Now, 
I'm occasionally, occasionally I'm hard of hearing. What does leave means? Leave. Thank you very much. Westminster, I hope you're listening. Because we all know that unlike Westminster and the politicians there, they view Brexit as a problem to be mitigated, whereas the opposite is true. Brexit is the biggest opportunity this country has ever had in the last 70 years. And whenever you talk to any of your friends, family, whatever, colleagues, you know, let's sell that positive message. People want an optimistic, ambitious, hopeful message. Brexit is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow the economy faster, to spend our money smarter, and to invest all over the regions of this great country so that we reduce inequality, because that is probably the greatest challenge we have. It's a huge opportunity, but you need strong, bold leadership that believes in it. So ladies and gentlemen, do we believe in Britain? Yes! I'm really hard of hearing. Do we believe in Britain? Yes! Let me see your placards. Yes! Fantastic. Now, the truth is, I've almost come to my time, but you know in reality, and I know, that I'm just the warm-up act. <laughs> it's all right, I can get over it. Because there's a certain other person who's had quite an influence in British politics in the last 25 years. <laughs> I told you I was hard of hearing. Um, the next speaker, without question, is the most influential person in British politics. There is no one else in this country that from deciding to do this rally four days ago can fill a room of 1,500 people with tens and tens and tens of thousands watching online. That is the power of someone who has changed the course of our country but who knows that there is a real betrayal at hand from the establishment. And therefore, that's why we've created the Brexit Party, so that we can make sure we change politics for good. So ladies and gentlemen, before we welcome Nigel to the stage, let's just remind ourselves what he looks like on the video. <laughs> the Brexit Party into those European elections, as it now looks certain they will happen. Anybody that has ever been in business knows that when you sit down for a negotiation, both sides are prepared to walk away unless terms can be agreed. Westminster used to be known as the mother of parliaments, and here we are behaving, frankly, like a banana republic, ignoring the views of the people. People weren't agreed on what leave right. meant. Right, simple, leave, There was full no stop. manifesto. Leave, leave. full stop. But full. there is leave no leave. Leave in the single market. Please welcome to the stage, Nigel Farage. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Hello, Birmingham. I'm back. I can, in some ways, scarcely believe that I'm on this stage this afternoon doing this because you see, what happened on June the 23rd, 2016, should have been decisive. By a margin, a clear margin of 1.3 million people, despite the fact we were told, do you remember by George Osborne? <laughs> oh, I've got better than that coming, don't you worry about that. 
despite the fact we were told by George Osborne there'd be an emergency budget, interest rates would have to rise, taxes would have to rise, despite the fact we were told by President Obama that we'd go... I've got a friend of the White House who would join in with that boot. <laughs> We were told we'd be at the back of the queue. We were told half a million jobs would go. We were told the whole country would close down. It would be a disaster. And despite all of that, oh, and I nearly forgot, the leaflet that David Cameron... You see, you're not booing him. You know why? You've all forgotten who he is. That's why. <laughs> and despite the fact that leaflet... Do you remember that leaflet that cost £9 million? that he sent to every house in the country warning us, telling us what it would mean, but unequivocally that whatever we decided would be implemented. Despite everything, we voted Brexit. And I remember, I remember thinking at about three o'clock the next morning, we've done it. We've done it. We've won this great battle. I really believe we've done it. And then, a year later, after Mrs May, a Remainer... <laughs> despite the fact she, in her general election manifesto, and let's remember, Jeremy Corbyn, in the Labour manifesto, <laughs> they both promised us in that general election that if you vote for us, we will carry out your wishes and make sure that Brexit happens. So we didn't vote Brexit once, we voted Brexit twice. And I thought then, we're on our way. And then the House of Commons voted on Article 50, that piece of the European Treaty that said we would leave on March the 29th and 498 MPs voted for it. It carried in the Commons with an extraordinary majority of 384. And Article 50 said we would leave on March the 29th with or without a deal. And I genuinely thought, I genuinely thought and believed on that day that we'd won. I genuinely believed we were on the path to becoming an independent, self-governing, proud, normal nation. And I'll admit that I perhaps did not spend so much of my life on the front line of politics. I thought I'd achieved the goal that I'd worked so hard for over the course of 25 years. And yet, and yet I'm here before you today because then I could not comprehend the sheer deceit, dishonesty, frankly verging on treachery that we have seen. They have betrayed our confidence. They have betrayed our trust. They have betrayed the entire democratic system that we in this country have valued so greatly that those that, those that went before us... And let's remember, let's remember those generations that went before us ably aided and helped by those from right across the Commonwealth Twice in the 20th century, we made massive sacrifices so that we could be a free, independent, democratic nation. <laughs> and now we see a gutless, useless, spineless class of career politicians most of whom have never had a proper job in their lives.
and none of whom have a clue how to do a deal, and they've led us to this mess. We've kicked the can down the road once, from the 29th of March to the 12th of April. We should have left the European Union at 11 p.m. last night, but now we're told it won't happen until the 31st of October. Halloween. <laughs> Trick or treaty. <laughs> and it's just not good enough. Now, I, I realised in December that the can was going to kick down the road, and I decided something had to be done about it. And that is why I decided I would set up the Brexit party, because it needed to be done. And today, we launched the campaign yesterday. Today is our first day of actually campaigning out with the public. We've been around the bullring market this morning. I can tell you I was there the week before the referendum back in 2016. The mood today was even stronger than it was just before that referendum. Oh, yes. And so I find myself, having spent 20 years in the European Parliament, 20 years I've been there, although I think, I think I've enjoyed it more than they have, let's put it like that. One or two speeches that have done quite well on YouTube, I seem to remember. But I, found, I find myself now standing here today in my sixth European election campaign. I shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here. None of this should be happening. We should have left the European Union. But I'm damned if after 25 years of fighting for this, I'm going to roll over and allow these politicians to do this to us. So let's fight back. Let's fight back. We won't stand for it. We won't stand for it. Thank you. But the Brexit party is now not just about Brexit. In fact, the word Brexit is about far more than us becoming an independent, self-governing nation. The word Brexit sums up the real division that exists in this country. Now, you'll be told that Britain is very divided because of Brexit. The truth is, the reason we have some division in this country over Brexit is that so many of our career political class simply refused to accept the result. Sir Nick Clegg being one. Yeah, yeah. Nick Clegg has never accepted the result. Now, this one is top of the pops. Tony Blair. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed that. Tony Blair never accepted the result. And in fact, a House of Commons that is a Remain House of Commons and a government that is made up of a Prime Minister and two-thirds of a Cabinet that are Remainers have just simply ex refused to accept the democratic result. We're told that we didn't know what we were voting for. How dare they? How dare they dare speak down to us like that? But it was perfectly clear. Every single leading proponent of both the Leave and the Remain arguments in that referendum said that a vote to leave was a vote to leave the European Union, to leave the single market and to leave the customs union. It could not have been clearer. And yet, yeah. 
And yet now we have the spectre of Mrs May and Mr Corbyn now trying, now trying to negotiate a new form of wording in the political declaration that is added to her dreadful treaty. And by the way, that treaty that Mrs May wants to get signed through the House of Commons is such a shameful document, it could only ever have been signed by somebody who had been defeated in war. It is a travesty of a document and it must never pass. But now we face European elections. They're going to happen on the 23rd of May. And can I tell you, after the launch of this party yesterday, the establishment is now panicking. <laughs> now, I'm an old timer. I've done this many times. This is my sixth European campaign. Richard Tice here. This is his first ever day campaigning as a candidate. Well done, Richard. I, um, I talked him into it over a glass of something. And he has no idea what's just happened to his life. But there we are. But I want to say this. If they think, and by the way, the launch yesterday went well. It went really, really well. People are joining us online. People are giving money to us online. I saw today in the streets of Birmingham a genuine, real enthusiasm for what we are trying to do. It is fresh, it is new, it is professional, it is patriotic in every single way. And do you know something? We're fighting this campaign with one simple objective, to win. <laughs> but there are some in the commentariat who think, ah, what they'll do to stop the Brexit party winning these elections is they will come to a deal between the Labour and Conservative parties, they'll come to a deal on a form of permanent customs union. They'll come to a deal on membership of the single market. They'll come to a deal on the continued free movement of people. They'll come to a deal and that'll be great because it'll stop the Brexit party from taking off. Let me tell you, if that grubby deal happens and if they're able to stop, which I don't believe they are, but if they're able to stop these European elections, far from that stopping the Brexit party, the Brexit party in the face of a level of betrayal on that level will literally explode and split the other parties in two. <laughs> oh yes, it will. The truth of it is, the truth of it is, there is not great division in this country because most people in this country are decent people. Most people in this country, many who voted Remain, say, but I thought we were a democratic nation. Wouldn't it be wrong not to carry out the wishes of the people? And actually, this is now about far more than us leaving the European Union. This is about... This is about our country with one of the longest serving continuous parliaments in the world. A parliament that is called the mother of parliaments. Can you imagine if in an African country an election, a referendum, had literally been overturned. Can you imagine the outcry from the international community? There'd be demands for the United Nations to be sent in and sort the thing out. And yet, that is exactly what is happening in our country, our supposedly great country. <laughs> the 
This is about democracy. This is about trust that needs to exist between the governors and the governed for the smooth functioning of a nation. This is about who we are as a country in the world. And what I see is a political class who are happy once every few weeks to return to Brussels like Oliver, saying, please, sir, can I have some more? I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this. I don't want to see, I don't want to see Britain humiliated on the world stage. And I believe in the hearts of people in this country that they don't want that either. Our problem is this. Our problem is not the British people who still believe in our nation, believe in our future, believe in our country and are unashamed to be patriotic about it. Our problem is not with the people. Our problem is with our leaders who for decades have operated a policy of managed decline. We have the wrong people leading us. Career politics has taken over. We used to have people in Parliament and in politics and in government who did it out of conviction, who did it out of a sense of duty. We now are filled with careerists. The nation is being let down. And I genuinely believe that this country now, we are lions led by donkeys. So, we are fighting back. We're fighting back today on the streets of Birmingham. We'll be fighting back every single day, not just of this European election campaign. In fact, for us in the Brexit party, the 23rd of May is just the beginning. We want, we want, we want to change politics for good. Change politics for good, completely. To go on to fight, we'll go on to fight by elections, we'll go on to fight general elections. Parliament no longer represents the people of this country. We must do something about that. Thank you. I embarrass easily, you know. If you believe that, you believe anything anyway. And our two-party system is no longer fit for purpose. Politics needs breaking up. Politics needs changing. And I believe we can. I believe we can, within the Brexit party now, be the catalyst for a fundamental change in the way this country is organised the way this country has run. I know that this is the most ambitious thing I've ever said on a political platform before in my life. But you know something? I've got a track record of saying ambitious things. In fact, I did, um, I did repeat it in the European Parliament three days after the referendum in 2016. And I arrived in the Parliament and it was as if you were attending a funeral. I mean, they were not. <laughs> well, you wouldn't be happy if someone took away 15 billion quid a year, would you? I mean, you know. And I remember getting up for that speech thinking, well, maybe, just maybe for the first time in my career in this institution, they might just treat me with a degree of respect. You see, I'm prone to folly, prone to error. <laughs> and of course, I got up to speak and about 400 of them started booing. So I thought, right, you're going to have some now. <laughs> so I said, so I said, when I came here 17 years ago, I said to you, I would lead a campaign to take the United Kingdom 
out of the European Union. And I said, you all laughed at me. Well, I said, you're not laughing now. And so it is, and so it is with this ambition with the Brexit party. It may seem to be impossible. It may seem to be too difficult. But I believe if ever there was a time for a fundamental change and shake-up in politics, in government, in our institutions, in the way in which they're run, if ever there was a time this was possible, it is now. But of course, Richard, myself, the other candidates, our team, all we can do is to provide the opportunity for those of you out there in our country, voters, to decide whether you're going to back us, to decide whether you're going to support us, to decide whether you're prepared to talk to your friends and your family to decide whether this actually is worth the battle. And I have to say this to those of you that have come here today at incredibly short notice, and thank you. I can tell as the campaign goes on, we're going to need bigger venues, I think. I really do. <laughs> but I can only say this that fundamental change, taking on and beating the establishment, are not things that happen because decent people nod their head and say, I agree with that. Fundamental shifts in society, the rebalancing that we need between people and the politicians will only come if people like you, attending events like this, people watching this now at home on the live stream or on the news later, it will only come if you determine not just to agree with us, but you determine that you will do something about it. And I ask you, I ask you, I ask you, are you with us? Thank you very much indeed. We're fighting back. Yep. There we are. It's my Freddie Mercury bit. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. All right. Yeah, sure. Are you with us? <laughs> well done. Has he lost his touch, ladies and gentlemen? I think he's just warming up. He sort of always knew that this was going to happen. Um, the truth is, as you've heard, this country deserves so much better. And the reason... The reason that this negotiation of this dreadful deal, this treaty, is because the people who negotiated it, they simply didn't believe in it. They didn't know how to negotiate. And so they got completely legged over. And that's why we need better people coming into politics. And that's why we are so excited about the quality of the candidates that are putting themselves forward, people who've really done something and achieved. And the unbelievable example this week of just how bad our civil servants and political class are at negotiating a deal and understanding basic negotiating techniques is when they decided it was a good idea to stop no-deal preparations. I mean... We've all, we've all been involved in doing deals, in buying and selling things. 
you know, the reason we got such a bad deal was because the other side knew that Mrs. May wasn't telling the truth when she said, no deal is better than a bad deal. The truth, we all know that no deal is always better than a bad deal. But if you take no deal off the table, what happens? You get completely and utterly shafted. And that, that, ladies and gentlemen, that typifies the incompetence of the current people running our country. And that is why things have to change for good. So the good news is also we've got some questions from various people as they came in uh, for Nigel. So I'll just glance at a couple. Yeah, they're not just for me, Richard. You're party chairman now, too. Oh, know. but that's, yeah, you see, but the role of party chairman is to delegate. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I get to ask the questions. <laughs> um, so, here we are. Uh, this is, I think it's Karen from Wales. If the Brexit party wins elected MEPs, what are the chances of them getting their seats at the European Parliament, or will it crumble before then? Well, well, it's a good question because actually it isn't just us that are fighting back against the political class. This is now happening across the whole of Europe. The whole of Europe. The, there's a growth on the right, the left, and the centre of parties across Europe who don't want to be governed by the Donald Tusks, by the Barniers, or the Junkers who isn't much good before lunch, let alone afterwards. <laughs> I, Karen, let me say this to you. Uh, there will not be a European Union in this shape and in this style in 10 years' time, and nor should there be. The idea, <laughs> the idea that nation states give up their autonomy, give up their individuality, give up their nationhood, and surrender it to a group of unelected old men in Brussels is an outrage. And I have to tell you, I am not anti-European at all. I love Europe. I love visiting Europe. It's great. It's great. Of course it is. But I want a Europe of nation states that make their own laws, control their own borders, have their own courts, and then we can trade together, cooperate together as friends living in the same street. The next question is from Phil from Huntington, and it's really, really important because in order to make this change, in order to transform politics, we've got to take votes from other political parties. And Phil's question, is does the Brexit party give the opportunity to unite both disillusioned Labour and disillusioned Tory voters for Brexit? Well, look, the idea on Brexit, let's just cast our, mind, our minds back, you know, 40, 50 years. There were some Conservatives who were very, very opposed to the common market. One of them came from Wolverhampton, Enoch Powell, who was very famous <laughs> and, and, and a, you know, 50 years on, a very controversial figure. But he was a conservative who was against the common market. But actually, the people really against the European project were the Labour Party. It was Tony Benn. It was Barbara Castle. It was, it was Peter Shaw. It was people like that. And, and then it became a more conservative thing. Bill Cash, John Redwood, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who... I wonder what the conversation was with his sister Renunziata yesterday. <laughs> but here's the point. Here's the point, folks, and it matters. Believing that we should be a nation. Believing we should be proud of it. Believing we should govern it ourselves. Believing that sovereignty should rest with the people of this country and not institutions overseas. This is not about 
This is not about being left wing or right wing. It's not about left or right. It's about right or wrong. That's what it's about. And I, our task in the Brexit party is to unite and bring together voters who in the past, Mr Chairman, I can call you that now, who in the past have voted Conservative, Labour, UKIP or perhaps many other parties. I hope people see that what we're giving them is an opportunity to teach the establishment a lesson that they will never forget, to make them understand. <laughs> to make them understand they cannot take us for granted, they cannot ride roughshod over us. And if they continue to ignore us, then our historic task will be to replace them, not just in the houses of, of, of Brussels and Strasbourg, but in the House of Commons too. <laughs> the, the shortest question is a little bit personal. Oh, gosh. Nigel. We're in trouble now. Nigel, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> I shan't say who it's from. It might embarrass her. Um, but <laughs> um, the next question from Andrew from Burton-on-Trent. If the European elections don't happen, what happens next for the Brexit party? The only reason that the European elections will not happen is because Mrs May's team... Oh, and by the way... I've not said enough about Mrs May this afternoon, I'm sorry. <laughs> she is, without doubt, the worst... <laughs> well, thank you, sir. It is Music Hall after all. Well done. <laughs> she is... <laughs> Oh dear, I've got the giggles now, we're in trouble. <laughs> the, she is, without doubt, not only the worst Prime Minister that I've seen in my lifetime, but the most dishonest one as well. <laughs> How many times has she said, we're taking back control of our laws, our money and our borders. I'm sure they wind her up at the back every morning and send her out to say it. 108 times she told us we'd be leaving on the 29th of March. Endlessly she told us she would not accept an extension beyond the 30th of June. And again and again and again she says one thing and does the opposite. She's a disgrace. Absolute disgrace. Absolute disgrace. The only reason the European elections will now not take place on May the 23rd is if the House of Commons, at the fourth attempt, votes for the new European treaty with a new, changed political declaration attached to it that commits us to being permanently in a customs union. <laughs> that would prevent us not just from making our own trade deals around the world, but also from setting our own tariffs. And let me tell you something. What we do, what the Europeans do on our behalf, is they favour European companies selling into this country over countries from the rest of the world selling into this country. And one of the reasons I so very much want Brexit is we as a nation uniquely, not just in the world today, but actually in the entire history of humankind, have a relationship with our former colonies in the shape of the Commonwealth. <laughs> and there are 2.4 billion people living in the Commonwealth. They have amongst them some of the fastest growing economies in the world and they speak English and they have common law. They are in many cases related to many of us as many of them are the other way around and they are our true friends in the world. 
They really, really are. So the only way this would happen is if the treaty gets agreed, as I say, with the amended political declaration, with a permanent customs union, and basically us being part of the single market as well. That is the only way these European elections can be stopped. And the reason they'll do it is they're terrified of what the Brexit party might do to their vote. And they might just be stupid enough. They might just, well, you never know with this lot, you know. <laughs> but, but they might just be stupid enough to do it. And if they think by starting an election and then stopping it, if they think by robbing us of yet another vote and completely betraying the meaning of Brexit, that somehow Nigel Farage and the Brexit party are going to pack their tents and go home, they've got another think coming. I think we've got time for three, three more questions. I'm feeling a bit left out. <laughs> so I'm actually going to answer this question myself. I'll give it a go. It's from Sophie from Cambridge. What can we do to stop business leaders overriding the will of individuals, including employees? I like this one because it gives me an opportunity, as I did yesterday, to talk about some of these supposed great business organizations. There's one in particular that's dear to my heart, not. It's called the CBI. That's better. They deserve as much of a boo as Tony Blair. Whoa, whoa, steady on. Let me tell you. Let me tell you a thing or two about the CBI. They didn't want the Thatcherite reforms in the early 80s that saved this country. They didn't want us to leave the exchange rate mechanism in the early 90s. They wanted us to join the euro. <laughs> Just imagine what would have happened if we'd joined the euro. And then, ladies and gentlemen, of course, they were part of Project Fear in the 2016 referendum. They were wrong then, again and again and again, and they continue, ladies and gentlemen, when they talk this nonsense about a cliff edge, they are wrong now, and they will always be wrong. Whatever they say and recommend, if you do the opposite, you'll be much better off. <laughs> Martin from Cannock asks, and this is a good question, will future politics in the UK be a mixture, potentially of smaller parties, forming alliances away from the broken two-party system? What do you think, Nigel? Well, it's possible. I mean, I do think there is the potential for a fragmentation in politics. And I, and I think, I mean, goodness knows, as leader of UKIP, I came very close to breaking the system, didn't quite manage. The first-past-the-post system is pretty brutal. I'm not pretending this journey we're embarked upon is easy. It isn't. But I do think the circumstances are unique. I do think the breakdown of trust that exists between voters and Parliament has never been greater. So I do see us. The question is, the question is, will other parties break through from the pro-Remain side? Now, the Liberal Democrats, of course, are a pro-Remain party who, who, under, who under Vince appear to be flatlining ever such a bit. But there is, of course, a new exciting force in British politics. <laughs> Chucker and his chums. <laughs> but I'm not sure any of them know how to boil an egg, <laughs> let alone set up a political party. And I might be wrong, I might be wrong, but he, I mean, if Chucker and his chums are ever going to get anywhere, they will have to do it on May the 23rd. But I suspect 
if they were to run again for their parliamentary seats, every single one of them, including the blessed Anna Soubry. <laughs> oh gosh, Tony Blair, you've got off now. It's Soubry. Well, I agree with you. But they would all lose their seats. I, it's tough to tell, Richard. I think there is a fragmentation of politics coming. I don't think it's easy to predict exactly what form and shape it will take. But all I really care about is that we get a party like this to be in a position of real power in this country. A party that believes in Britain, that believes in its people. The, the final question, the final question actually is from Jules from Warwick, and it's a really good way to finish, not only for all of us believers here, but also actually for everybody to remind ourselves, Nigel, why are we actually more at risk by staying in the European Union? Well, this always gets forgotten, you know, and the other side say, ah, and it's the classic Alistair Campbell, New Labour narrative, you know. Well, he's a boo, but he's not quite super, is he? <laughs> I said it was musical. <laughs> the, they created the narrative, they created the narrative that the Leave side had won the referendum because of Russian money, all untrue. They created the narrative, the Leave side had won because they'd lied, because Boris put a slightly high figure on the side of a bus. And the truth of it, of course, is that it's the Remain side that have been lying to us for over 50 years. Anybody here? Anybody here over 60 will remember in the, yeah, in the referendum, in the referendum, you were told back in 75, remember, it's a common market. It's about trade. Nothing to worry your little heads about when they all knew from the start what the true intentions were. And the lies have gone on through the decades and through the years, and still they go on. The idea that remaining is a constant and leaving is a variable risk misunderstands what is happening in Brussels today. They are now hell-bent, hell-bent on building a unitary form of government, not accessible direct directly to the electorate, that is going to build a United States of Europe, that is going to build and wants to complete by 2025 a European army, a European air force, and a European navy. And when I questioned Lord Adonis about this the other day, oh, he said, some people say there'll be a European army, but it's not a reality. Well, I tell you what, the European Parliament says there'll be a European army. Donald Tusk says there'll be a European army. Jean-Claude Juncker says there'll be a European army. Angela Merkel says there'll be a European army. Emmanuel Macron says there'll be a European army. This is better than conducting polling or focus groups, really, isn't it? They all say there's going to be a European army. Why would we want to stay part of a project that wants to take away yet more democracy from nation states, that wants all of its members ultimately to join the euro, and wants to complete a European army by 2025. Why not be an independent state? Why not keep the British army? Why not work with our friends like the Americans in NATO to guarantee our future security? Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end this afternoon. But, but, <laughs> more. It's like, it's like a pantomime, isn't it? <laughs> but, 
There's, there are two very simple messages to take home to friends, family, and colleagues. And these are really important. Firstly, Brexit is a huge opportunity. Mm, big message. What is it? <laughs> I'm going deaf. <laughs> it's a huge opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. The second thing is the Brexit party is here to change politics for good in this country. So have a fantastic, safe trip home. But before we do that, let's just remind ourselves, do we believe in democracy? Yes! Do we believe in Britain? Yes! Look after yourselves. Have a very good weekend. Thank you.